Yes. Uh, today I'm giving a talk on linear instrumentation, the first of a potentially three-part series on test equipment, if you can stand me that much. Um, linear instrumentation uh, is everything you see in front of us. Uh, typically this updates from the 1930s to the 1960s. Um, and per accuracy, some of this is competitive with modern-day equipment. Um, and contains bridge techniques that are very useful in modern circuits and have very interesting uh, industrial design both inside and out. Um, and none of this on this table, except for the supply, which I'm just using the power of politeness, um, is electronic. It's all electric. Um, and you'll see why in a second. So just some quick things that probably most of you have. A standard is a well-known reference that varies little and it's well characterized. Accuracy is transferability. Precision is repeatability. No one ever says that that's succinctly, but they really should. Um, a cell is a single component of a battery, typically with a potential between one and one million <coughs> volts. So, this is a cell. Um, an EMF is electromotive force. It's just a cool way to say volts. Um, Ohm's law of E equals IR. York Simon Ohm in 1827 wrote this really interesting book called Die Galvanische Kette, Mathematisch Gearbeitet which is uh, the galvanic circuit investigated mathematically. Um, for element materials, for example wire, um, the current through a conductor between two points is proportional to the potential difference across the points. The concept of proportionality is resistance. Um, this was a big breakthrough um, in determining the feasibility of long distance telegraphy systems. Um, there were a couple of competing theories against Ohm's law and they were all wrong. It's also elegantly simple, uh, which is what's so cool about it. Um, until the late 60s, the only quantity that was directly measurable was current, and this is because all analog meters used magnetic fields to deflect a needle, and we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, the only standardized quantities were voltage and resistance. Um, this is a voltage standard containing both mercury and a mercury cadmium amalgam. It's just delicious. We'll get back to that in a second. And this is an example of a standard resistor that I just made. And these are also uh, standardized resistors. Um, resistance was redefined in 1990 to be the quantum Hall effect. It previously was defined by this wire here, uh, which has a very specific resistance and has virtually no temperature coefficient. Um, so, in most of the instruments, the only two common things in them that are classified as exotic materials are this alloy called manganin and an alloy called invar. Manganin has virtually no temperature coefficient with its resistivity. Invar has virtually no temperature coefficient with its mechanical properties. So, in a lot of these meters, um, their physical construction contains invar and a lot of the resistances in these devices contain manganin. Um, a lot of these things cannot be calibrated, and the reason why is their resistances internally are standards themselves. Um, and so you can characterize the device to see how far off it is from real life, but you can't actually correct it, which has advantages and disadvantages. Um, voltage was also redefined in 1990. Um, Current was measured with a galvanometer. Um, this is a galvanometer. I'll talk about it in a second. This is another galvanometer. Um, in precision applications, they utilize bridges to sense flows of current. We'll talk about that in a second. They sometimes used optical amplification. Um, and ammeters was used to sense larger currents and with resistors, voltages. Um, voltage was standardized with the Weston cell. That's what this is. Um, Optical amplification is a really clever technique. Um, and I'll pull this up on the dot com so you can actually see it. Um, okay. So in here we have 
Might help if you hit the lights in front of the screen. Where are you at?
Type C. A lot of these have internal galvanometers. This one we'll use for something later. So here on this instrument, you're now upside down. You were right side up. Okay. So here on this instrument, um, we have. saw what it looked like, and now you'll be able to see the things that matter when I hook some stuff up. So here you have the millivolts knob, and you actually read out the number of millivolts with that line. So this would be no voltage. This clamp protects the galvanometer needle because they are sensitive instruments, much like a very expensive mechanical watch. And there's a knob here, you may be able to see, um, that's for standardizing our battery. So I take a battery, this is not the kind of battery that they would use at the time, but it is still a volt and a half. And we connect it up, like so. that my galvanometer needle is centered. This is actually part of the most delicate operation. And these instruments vary in the performance a lot, whether or not you have them perfectly level. Um, so then we press the SC button. And this applies the standard cell in that bridge. And we balance the standard cell against our battery with this um, so you'll notice we're not taking absolute measurements, we're only taking relative measurements. And that's what makes these devices so powerful um, and precise. Because it removes the accuracy of your meter from the equation. The only accuracies that matter are in the potentiometer in here and how well you can see um, and how sensitive that is. But we'll, I'll be taking all these devices apart uh, after I finish going through the PowerPoint, um, and so I'll be able to explain how exactly they tick. They're quite beautiful. It's like they were made out of furniture or something. Which is sadly, something they have somewhat lost. Q is for charge, C is for column. Some of the unit, units on these things are a little funky. So I'll set this supply to 120 millivolts, and we'll see what exactly it gives out. Um, because something makes me think that the meter, this box in front of me, that's from about 1938, is more accurate than the gauge on the front of this meter, or the power supply. It's kind of fun. Our EMF, 
by pressing this button, you'll see that the needle is deflected. You are the control loop for this device. Um, so it takes some practice to balance quickly, particularly some of the more sophisticated ones we'll show later. Um, you can see it's putting out very close to what it's claiming. Um, about 122 volts. Um, and I've actually checked the accuracy of this with other instruments, and it is accurate to within half a millivolt. It's not bad. I think. So, moving on. Voltage dividers are something that I know all of you are familiar with. Um, and they allow for placing any common voltage within the range of the potentiometer. And so they use sets of accurate wire wound resistors on rotary switches. Um, this one's from the 40s. Um, you can tell sort of a different style of design is made of aluminum. Um, but with this device, you're able to um, do a lot of stuff. You're able to Divide down um, a voltage. Um, and so this one has an input impedance of 100,000 ohms. And so you connect your input here, and your output would appear here. And through these connections, if you say, for example, set this to 2, 1, 3, um, you have 2 times 0.1 times your input voltage, 1 times 0.01 times your input voltage, uh, 3 times 0.001 times your input voltage, and then it also has the linear here that's 0.0001 times your input voltage. And so what this does is allows you to adapt the 200 odd, or in the case of the potentiometer we'll pull out later, um, 1 volt range uh, into every ordinary voltage you would deal with. Now, normally, for most laboratory applications, you'd be perfectly happy with a meter like this that's direct reading. Um, and so all of these instruments um, throughout their lives are typically only used in metrology applications uh, for calibration and in finalizing um, the literature coming with your product after production. Um, Current shunt allow a measurement of currents with a potentiometer um, because the potentiometer measures voltage, not current because it's measuring the current through your resistance. Um, and so you would use a variety of instruments like this, which is called an irritant shunt, um, or this, which is another rather large shunt. Um, it goes up 250 amps down to 0.75 amps. Um, and you connect your potentiometer here uh, to measure the voltage based on the current flowing through it. Um, so, they are also typically manganin because it prevents the heating of that resistive element from the measurement and having the resistance change. Um, weak stone bridges are something that you're also all tortured with a 210. <laughs> um, and I have two here on this table, only one of which I can operate in any expedient manner. Um, the Weakstone Bridge is a device that uses um, four resistances, one of them unknown, to measure that unknown resistance through measuring the current flow that derives from an imbalance in that bridge. Um, here we have a Leeds and Northrop portable Kingston bridge um, that also has a lot of extra features that I want to talk about. So say if I have 
one of my special standard resistors that was right there. So I got oh, here it is. This one I know is about 500 kilo ohms to a fairly good tolerance. I think it was 0.01 percent, which is pretty good for 500,000 ohms. Um, so we connect it up right here. Oops, you can't see. If it wants to pop right today. And you'll notice that this device has attachment points for an external galvanometer for higher precision, like our optical galvanometer here, or the attachment of external battery. But in this case, um, we have the internal battery in it. So, to measure resistance, This goes here. And this goes here. These change the operation of the meter. They're very low resistance switches. Typically, the higher your resistance is, the larger an external battery you may connect because the more deflection it gives you for any imbalance in resistance. Um, in this case, what claimed to be 500,000 ohms is actually 482,000 ohms, which is within its rating. So, this is a portable weight stone bridge. There are other bridges. Uh, like Kerry Foster Kelvin Bridge. <coughs> this is a, Kel a Kerry Foster Bridge, bridge right here. Um, and what this does is it allows you to measure very, very small resistable wire. So we have a solid mangan rod here of known resistance that's plotted out on this meter stick, essentially, material. Um, we use these large lugs to connect a wire through here. We place a battery across it so that we're forcing a current through the whole loop. And we place a galvanometer here. And we move this until the galvanometer balances. Um, or until visual wakes up. <laughs> um, there, are, there are other kinds of bridges, like impedance bridges, which play with our good old friend's phasers to find the equivalent piece um, of the component, say for example, a capacitor. Um, Leeds and Northrop never really made impedance bridges because they did something that wasn't just resistance. Um, so I have one here made by uh, the General Radio Company, which was kind of the king of impedance bridges. Uh, this was, this is from 1965. In 1965, not adjusted for inflation, it was $1,000, and it's still competitive with measuring equipment. Um, it's really a marvel how well it works, and it's one of my favorite things I own, because uh, it's very, very interesting. So, to use one of these, these things, 
that looks like it's out of a science fiction television show. Um, sort of like me right now. Um, I don't know what show that is, though. Uh, you attach, say for example, here's a resistor. This is a 0.02% precision laser trimmed resistor. Not really something they had at the time, unfortunately for them. Um, and we discover that we don't like fluorescent lights because they can't be dimmed. There we go. Um, It's a horror film. Well, anyway, um, so in this case, it's a lot harder. Um, <coughs> you set your um, meter, which I had left on, so we'll see if it works, to six volts. Um, that it will force through this resistance. We then. Oh, there we go. It was already set up. Um, we turn this needle, which selects our range, to what's closest. Then we turn this dial until it nulls. And you see that it's actually a mirrored range so that you can correct for parallax error. And we see that we are, in fact, um, directly on the 2.5 here, or 2.5. Ohms times 100, so 250 ohms. Now, for capacitors, well, I didn't even know. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> for capacitors, um, you connect them just the same way, except instead of putting a um, DC voltage through them, you put an AC frequency, in this case, a kilohertz, or as it likes to say, a kilocycle. <coughs> um, we then pick uh, either parallel capacitance or series capacitance. Um, in this case, we would probably pick series capacitance because it's a low, relatively low leakage capacitor, it's a ceramic capacitor. Um, and then we get to play with two dials at the same time now, which starts to get a little bit more challenging. Um, um, so we have this, we start turning ourselves around and we're not running with anything. So we reduce the sensitivity of our nulling amplifier with this control. Um, and so we're actually, this instrument does have an amplifier in it, so that deviates a little bit from the theme of the talk. But instruments like this did exist that just had very sensitive needles. Um, and then you can see that as I turn it, we're getting close and far away, but that was really our close spot right there. Oh, that's pretty good. So you'll see that for this one, it bounces off, always on a forward scale on both sides. And that's because we're dealing with impedance. Um, and we take this knob to measure our leakage. And because both are interactive, we can flip this, which will cause both of them to operate simultaneously because they're interactive parameters. We can then start turning up our sensitivity and see how close we can get it. You might imagine balancing one of these things can take a lot of work and is generally a huge pain. However, because we're doing a bridge-based measurement where we're canceling out our value with internally generated values, the results are quite accurate. Um, in this case, this is a 0.22 microfarad capacitor and we're reading it out as being 0.225 with virtually no leakage against the ceramic capacitor. Um, you can apply external frequencies or bias depending on what component you're using because a lot of different things like a lot of different things, but that's outside the scope of what I'm talking about. Um, so we'll move this back over here and keep going.
So, um, I had mentioned that this bridge has some other capabilities, and that is that it can do what's called a Murray loop or a Marley bridge configuration. And what that does is, um, I actually use a matrix switch on this, doesn't make any sense, but um, what that means. is that um, you can connect this in a variety of different ways with cables or other things. And what you'll actually be able to do is either determine the open location or a closed fault in a cable as long as the resistance of the cable is well known um, per distance, which it was very useful, and that's why a box like this would have been very common for anyone working with telegraphy systems uh, in railroads, etc. Uh, and was how you would troubleshoot most common problems. So, that was that. Um, now we get to play with some cool things, if you're interested. Uh, because you'll notice there are a lot of this table that I haven't picked up or looked at. Um, suppose we can start with this. This is a very special kind of Galva number, commonly used in telegraphy uh, outdoors. Um, it requires no lamp, but is still optical, um, which is very convenient for portable use. Um, particularly in sunlight, um, so that the brighter the sun got, the more easily you could see what you were doing rather than the other way around. Uh, How many keys do you want? A few, not as many as you want. It's a fairly delicate device, and that's why it's closed. So how it works is you have a scale here, uh, positive and negative, that goes in the instrument so. And you have a prism in the base of this microscope-like device that you flip up. And you'll notice here is our old <coughs> edge, the optical galvanometer, which reflects the instant light on the scale, off of the mirror, up through the prism, into the eyepiece. Um, it's a really clever little thing. And it allows you to have that super high precision that you're used to in the laboratory for measuring very, very small currents, um, nanoamperes or less, um, without any electronic components. Or without any noise. Um, because there's nothing to introduce noise other than uh, old quantum effects and such things that are outside the scope of this talk and also at the time completely unknown. So, the reason why I was walking over here is I was trying to decide which box to open first. Um, this is a very sophisticated Wheatstone bridge. Um, in fact, by far the most sophisticated one I've ever seen and completely awe-inspiring in its construction. Um, it allowed for you to compensate for the resistance in your galvanometer. Um, allowed you to compensate for small variances in battery and standard voltage. It has a lot of very special um, switches in it that allow for very low resistance connections. Um, furthermore, you can attach a temperature controller to it that keeps an oven that holds your resistances, your standard resistances, very constant. Um, that was how this gained such accuracy. Such accuracy in measuring millivolt level potentials had one primary application, and that is why this is essentially the same thing as I have, except at a much lower scale. Um, and that is to measure temperatures with thermocouples. So for measuring the voltage output of a 
thermocouple junction required a lot of accuracy, a lot of precision if you wanted to really know what temperature something was. So this is the inside of this fellow. Um, these heat sink, this inner oven, which is made of balsa wood and aluminum casting. Um, um, the temperature is kept constant by a mercury thermometer, which comes out on this edge and has connections inside, which allow for an external relay to switch the heater on and off based on the presence or absence of mercury in that location. Um, these are your resistors for lower ranges, or for higher ranges, and your resistances for lower ranges are inside the box. Um, there are also a variety of other small loops here. For example, these that provide for temperature compensation because the resistance varies very specifically with uh, temperature. Um, so that's pretty neat, I think. Um, and I'll flip this guy over and leave it out for afterwards. <laughs> he likes to shed. Hold on. Um, this is in the K line of Leeds and Northrop of the most precise potentiometers they ever made. Um, and how it works is you have a coarse voltage setting here from zero to a volt and a half. You can set what your standard cell is at the time. These potentiometers on the side provide for compensation between the standard cell and your uh, battery. And then this turns, and as it rises, you compare it against this glass scale here with the numbers here to get uh, four significant digits, which is not too bad for a mechanical device. And that's what I was going to pull out in a second to use with the optical galvanometer. So we'll see how accurately we can measure something. Um, this is um, a power factor meter, which I know all of you are familiar with power factor. power factor. What's novel about this is that in this age, instruments of course had no electronics, and so this device measures power factor through magnetic multiplication in the meter movement. So it replaces the external um, magnet with a coil or in this case several coils um, to compensate and that's why um, these meters, these dy dynamometer type meters um, that measure wattage, power factor, uh, current, uh, and other things that have two coils are actually true RMS. <coughs> um, the only other good way of measuring true RMS is thermally, um, which is still done today. Uh, this is an example of one such watt meter that has magnetic multiplication coils. So, I'll clear out some of this stuff and set up the K2. What we're going to do with the K2 today is check two of my standard cells against each, against each other. Which is something that it was actually made to do. Um, In a laboratory setting, because if you had a bunch of these devices, you'd want to characterize. That is not right there, uh, you'd want to characterize your standard cells, um, so that you had a known offset that could be factored in when you're making precision measurements. So. This also has a standard cell in it. Um, you use this crank attached to the side to compensate. Um, the difference between this indicator and my other one is that this one, or my own potentiometer, is that this one has a fitting for an internal battery. This type of battery has not been made for about 40 years. But conveniently enough, you can replace it with a diesel. So as we clear things off a little bit, make room. We're going to crack open this potentiometer and take a look inside. And 
preparation for measuring the uh, accuracy of the standard cell against my other standard cell, which is also not that accurate because it's really, really old. But it gives you an idea of a standard procedure that the standardization will be used for. So there we have our potentiometer. see on the screen. So we take out these four screws on the lid. And the whole thing will come apart for us very neatly. The top of this is actually supposed to be black, like all these other instruments. Um, because it, most of these instruments are made out of um, bakelite and maple for the laboratory instruments, or bakelite and pine for the field instruments. Um, but this bakelite had oxidized, and so you'll see underneath that it, it's actually black. Like that. So here we have our potentiometer coil, uh, which on the edge you may be able to see has a finely wound wire of accurate resistance. Here's our battery correcting, correcting potentiometer. Um, here is the magnet assembly for the galvanometer which sits on this post. Um, and here is actually a saturated Weston cell. Um, so you can see the side of the amalgam and the mercury. Um, and it's still fully functional and perfectly happy. Um, so technically you shouldn't run the upside down, but it will work today. Um, so we take our good old V2 over here. As I shuffle things around again, I take my Weston cell and I attach it to the standard cell attachments on the back of that device. Morgan looked extra cheery. <laughs> for our galvanometer. I'll place up here. As I make a mess. This one simply has uh, two attachment points for the galvanometer, for either a 2,000 ohm galvanometer or a 200 ohm galvanometer. Um, 
And the reason why it's required is because if you were to use another method, it could potentially um, cause a current to flow through our potentiometer, um, which could reduce the voltage output and give us an accurate reading, which of course in this application is forbidden because we wouldn't want to have that um, because we're trying to see if it's accurate. Um, and so if we have inaccuracies in our measurement of accuracy, then we just better go home. Uh, now, there is of course a lot of inaccuracy in all of this, but what's important is what your definition of a lot is. In this case, it's in the tenths of millivolt or less. Um, and at the time, there was virtually nothing that they dealt with in existence that required any higher accuracy than that, other than other pieces of measuring equipment. So we're going to attach this, this post. And it may be that these connections are not secure enough, but we'll see if anything happens when we hit the uh, EMF button. Okay. So, we'll see if this works the way it did earlier. So it's around zero right now, which is what we'd expect because there's no current flow. Um, and I'll just start playing with this. So I know this standard cell right now is about 1.01771 volts. And my national laboratory that I sent to told me this. I'm kidding, but essentially that's the procedure. Um, and so I set that way down there on my standard cell correction. In fact, it's lower than the standard cell correction actually goes, because why would I ever have such a poor standard cell? Um, did you tell we pegged our galvanometer? And so we want to work on compensating for a battery. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of spring and not a lot of damper in that movement. So it requires a lot of finicky twiddling. The whole point is so that you have a zero point and you know exactly where it is and you keep going back to it. So let's see. Zero, 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 zero. zero, zero. Almost there. Let me get the higher sensitivity button and start walking back to it, but that it's that knob, and now you're all getting bored. Oh look, it's pretty light. Look at the pretty light. <laughs> it's not blinking. It's moving. And it's got a pretty incandescent color, which you don't see anymore with those pale, sickly LEDs. So then we switch our knob over to measuring EMF. And this should have done something. Obviously, I have a bad connection with my email. <coughs> Let's see if I can make this balance. Oh, well, there we go. Come on. Okay. Now that we know we have a solid connection, we'll start turning this knob until we have some form of point on here. And what I, I 
expect to find, because we're in a room temperature environment, is that this standard cell is actually more accurately on the original Weston voltage than the one that I have below me. Um, however, it may also be upside down, which is making it very unhappy. And I progressively go to a higher sensitivity knob, which isn't doing anything for me. What is that sensitivity knob actually physically adjusting? The buttons, the amount of current allowed to flow through the meter, full scale. Okay. It's a current divider, essentially. Uh, oh, my email is good. I need to do something about this. Let's pull this down there like that. What I find so amazing is that all the stuff still works, so I suppose it's not that surprising considering how simple it all is. Um, but it was made to a standard and to a quality that is really quite foreign to us now. And it's not really something that anyone at any company, for anyone at all, even the most wealthy people who want mechanical watches for some reason, uh, ever can get. And that's why I find it very interesting to study and examine um, because it's, it's a part of our history. Um, I suppose sounds kind of funny coming from what you want to so be it. Check against the standard cell to make sure that the balance that I did was was okay. And it is not. Something has drifted here. There's no polarity indication on the western side. <laughs> in fact, there is. The mercury side is the panic, but that's likely our problem. Oh, it, yes. Okay, that makes a lot more sense now.
If I change a link on here, I can change it from being a 2,000 2, ohm galvanometer to a 200 ohm galvanometer, which should reduce our bounce because it forces more current through it. Or it won't do anything at all. We'll see. Unfortunately, while I did test this meter, I did not test it with the. Oh, yeah, that's right. I didn't test it with this galvanometer because it was living in an individual's office, which is not well entered. Okay. Um, so now we start working on our vernier knob here to reduce our deflection. You sort of have to watch where it averages because you lose good contact as you're spinning the thing. And that means that we need to change ranges. I ran into the end of the book. whose job was to sit there and spin this thing. <laughs> He's probably paid a lot of money to do it. Okay. So, we've nulled our meter. So we read out we have one point one seven two volts, which is a perfectly reasonable number for Weston cell, considering this one is currently 1.0171 volts. Um, and so now we've characterized and figured out the voltage of our Western cell to quite a number of figures. And in fact, if we were working with smaller potentials, um, I can actually set this into 0.1 and 0.01 volt loads where it will actually um, measure potentials down to the nanovolts. It's fairly impressive for something that's just batteries and potentiometers. So, that's pretty much it um, for today. So, any questions? Any other things? How does contact resistance affect these measurements? Fortunately, thanks to uh, Kirchhoff's current law, we're always forcing currents through things. Okay, so, because they're all current measurements, it's okay? Yes. Because they're all current measurements, it's okay. Um, you will have transient issues like you were seeing with the galvanometer if you hit a bumpy spot. Um, but essentially because they're all current measurements, because you do have to force a current through the galvanometer to do anything, um, you're playing the force current game and you don't have contact resistance issues. Which is really lucky for these folks. Now for the Wheatstone bridges, it's a whole other matter. Um, it's the same with shunts. And so that's why, say for example, on this shunt, you have, you have very large contact points. Um, on this uh, Curry Foster Bridge, you have massive bars, um, and on this Wheatstone Bridge, for example, um, you can tell, you can see the size of your switches. You have a multiple leaf silver-plated copper thing presses into these large points. Um, but, yeah, for the, for the potentiometric measurements, it's not an issue. And that's kind of the whole point. Um, so, this <coughs> is a spool of manganin wire, as I kept mentioning. Um, which I was very happy to find here, because that means that I can make some resistance standards for the lab. Because it's not inexpensive stuff. Um, to extend and perform laboratory automation, a lot of these things, they would use um, relays like this. Um, this is a relay that's sensitive down to about 4 milliamps. And so it's one of the ways you can start switching things in, things in and out. And um, because the volt was only redefined <coughs> in 1990, actually going to be redefined again soon, um, they plan, or many laboratories often had huge banks of standard cells on relay scanners that they would measure off of each other and perform averaging on. Um, 
to make sure that their values were accurate. Um, and in fact, that was one of the ways of getting closer to one of those saturated cells is to just have a whole bank that you average together instead of having to have a temperature control box. Um, this bridge, uh, this Wheatstone bridge also features large contacts inside. All of the resistors that you see in here typically look like wax-based things. They are manganin um, spools on ceramic forms with beeswax on them. Beeswax does two things. It keeps moisture out. And it's an indicator to whoever is performing the service on the instrument that you just blew up that you put too much current through the resistor. Um, so we've been doing the, the, that kind of indication for a long time. It's sort of like the little pad in your cell phone that turns red if it gets wet. But in this case, put too much current through your manual resistor. Um, there's a couple of other similar instruments that you find in a laboratory. Um, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, for example, resistance decade boxes, which are essentially the Wheatstone bridge minus the bridge um, for being able to substitute resistances in. Um, larger shunts, smaller shunts, all set of this stuff. But this is essentially the overview of how test equipment used to be done and where test equipment came from, um, which we'll build on next time at some point with uh, nonlinear components. So starting with uh, VTBMs or vacuum tube voltmeters and moving on through solid state methods. So you can see in this bridge where you have um, these connections to your resistance decades, they have very large contacts um, that are white. <coughs> actually scratched into with the connector. So that's that. Right. Any other questions? If lab equipment was Bakelite and maple and field equipment was Bakelite and pine, where did that come from? Um, durability. Actually, I think this may be walnut. Um, yeah, it looks like walnut. Yeah, that makes sense. So the place where I said pine with walnut, <laughs> pine doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I was going to say context. pine for durability is making yeah. sense. Yeah. No. Um, it's primarily that maple is really, really pretty, but it's an easily damaged finish. Uh, walnut is a very dense, durable wood uh, with thicker grain. Um, so you can tell, say for example, this was a field instrument, this is a laboratory instrument. That was a laboratory instrument, this is a field instrument. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. This finishometer was for field use, whereas my finishometer was for laboratory use. This one, this finishometer is specifically made for thermocouples. Um, so, yeah, that's that. How'd you get interested in this stuff? Um, I've always found the idea of measuring things to be very interesting because in a way it's all made up. But as long as everything that you make up can be accurately referenced to everything else you make up, it's okay. Um, and the fact that we have these easily measured constants in a very complicated world that allow us to simplify down our complexities into a needle moving back and forth is just very fascinating to me. Um, the other interesting thing is that even though your modern meters in the lab have a screen and lots of buttons and beep at you. Um, a lot of their guts are very similar to electronically varied versions of this. Um, and so it's very useful to learn <coughs> and interesting to reference. So. All right. Thanks, Tom.